Okay. Okay. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon a todos. Welcome to the uh, sixth annual Elena Maria Viramontes lecture in Latina, Latino, Latinx literature. We would like to begin by acknowledging that CSULB is located on the sacred site of Pavangna. We acknowledge that we are on the land of the Tongva, Gabrileño, and the Ahachamen, Juaneño nations who have lived and continue to live in the areas known as Los Angeles County and Orange County. We recognize the Tongva and the Ahachamen nations and their spiritual connection as the first stewards and the traditional caretakers of this land. We thank them for their strength, perseverance, and resistance. Again, uh, welcome everyone to the Elena Maria Viramontes lecture in Latina, Latino, Latinx literatures. My name is Dennis Lopez, and I am an associate professor in the Department of English at CSU Long Beach, and one of the members of the Viramontes Lecture Organizing Committee. After two years of postponements and cancellations, we are very excited to once again host the Viramontes Lecture at CSU Long Beach. The Viramontes Lecture in Latinx Literature was founded in spring 2015, when we organized an event to commemorate the work of Los Angeles native Elena Maria Viramontes, one of the most important Chicana writers of the post 1960s Chicano movement generation. From the start, the lecture and its related activities have been dedicated to the creation of a public space for community members, faculty, staff, and students to engage with and discuss issues related to Latinx literature and culture with some of the most important writers and scholars in the field. We are especially proud of the lecture's creative writing workshop for CSULB students, a feature of the Viramontes lecture series that has allowed over 100 CSU Long Beach students to share space with prominent Latinx writers and poets. Our goal in organizing the Viramontes lecture continues to be the creation of critical public spaces where we can participate in collective dialogue with both established and new voices in Latinx literature and scholarship in order to bring much needed attention to the various cultural and social issues most relevant to Latinx communities. Since our inaugural lecture by Elena Maria Viramontes in spring of uh, 2015, we have hosted Manuel Muñoz, Pura Joan Noel, Aracelis Germay, and Cherie Moraga, all of whom are widely recognized and accomplished authors. And today, after two years of anxious delays due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we are thrilled to welcome the award-winning poet and activist, Javier Zamora. We're also equally thrilled that the lecture's namesake, Elena Maria Viramontes, will be able to join Javier Zamora in conversation following his reading. Please let me take a moment to recognize and thank the co-organizers of this year's event. From the Department of Chicano and Latino Studies, Professors Ana Sandoval, Macy Rojas, Griselda Suarez, and Kiki Shaver. And from the Department of English, Professors René Trevino and Araceli Esparza. We would also like to thank Lisa Barrett from the Department of English and Michelle Seals from the Department of Chicano and Latino Studies for their, continu for their continuous administrative support in helping us to organize and host the Vida Montes lecture. And last but not, but definitely not least, thank you to Debbie Hildreth Pisarsik for helping us to navigate this webinar landscape that continues to be very foreign to all of us. As is the case every year, the Viramontes lecture is a truly collaborative effort. And it was the generous and enthusiastic financial support of various departments and organizations that has allowed this event to come about tonight. First and foremost, we thank our two host departments, the Department of Chicano and Latino Studies and the Department of English. We also would like to thank the College of Liberal Arts Scholarly Intersections Program, the College of uh, Liberal Arts Office of the Dean, the Dream Success Center, the Office of Multicultural Affairs, the Department of International Studies, the Office of the President, the President's Commission on the Status of Women, the Arts Council for Long Beach, and the national nonprofit organization, Poets and Writers. Thank you again so very much to all of our sponsors. Now, uh, let me turn the floor over to my colleague, Araceli Esparza, who will introduce our keynote poet for this evening. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dennis, and good afternoon, everyone. It is an honor to introduce Javier Zamora, this year's featured creative writer for the Elena Maria Viramontes annual lecture in Latina, Latino, Latinx literature. Zamora is part of an emerging US Central American literary canon, and his poetry and prose writing offer urgently needed perspectives on US Salvadoran identity formation and the ongoing crisis conditions and violence Salvadorans have experienced in El Salvador, Mexico, and the US. His poetry poignantly represents unaccompanied child migration, family separation, the 12 year US funded civil war in El Salvador, and the afterlife of civil war related violence, including extreme poverty, political instability and corruption, gang violence, and the mass displacement of children and adults from El Salvador. Zamora writes in a testimonial vein that speaks to how he and his family have been impacted by these realities. And he encounters the dehumanize and he counters the dehumanizing and sensationalized representation of an unaccompanied child migration and El Salvador that dominates US media. His writing offers a critique of the brutality of migration and war and a critique of the racism and xenophobia that those who have been displaced by violence face in the US and Mexico. Reflecting Viramontes' commitment to highlighting the relationship between creative writing and politics, Zamora's poetics are a reminder that poetry can make critical political interventions and can also be a means for giving witness to experiences of violence and a salve for processing and healing from trauma. As Zamora notes in a 2016 interview with Alejandro Córdoba, Toda mi poesía es personal. Yo, escri yo escribo para sanar. He sufrido mucho y he tenido tiempos muy malos. La poesía me encontró y yo la necesitaba. Así que la uso para sanar, para recordar. All my poetry is personal. I write to heal. I have suffered a lot and I have had very bad times. Poetry found me and I needed it. So I use it to heal and remember." End quote. Indeed, it is evident that in his poetry and prose writing, Zamora processes the personal impact of family separation on children, parents, and grandparents that is wrought by migration and displacement and the devaluing of immigrant life in the US and Mexico. These are deeply personal topics for our featured author. Zamora was born in the coastal town of La Herradura, El Salvador in 1990, two years before the signing of the peace accords that ended the civil war. His father, who was one of 17 siblings, some of whom were in the military and others of whom were revolutionaries, was forced to leave El Salvador in 1991, when Zamora was only one, having little hope that the war would ever end. His mother migrated to the US in 1995, when Zamora was four years old fleeing social and interpersonal violence within her family. In 1999, Zamora became an unaccompanied child migrant when at the age of nine, he began his journey to the US from El Salvador, traveling through Guatemala, Mexico, and eventually the Sonoran Desert to reunite with his, with his parents. Zamora traveled unaccompanied by family and aided by other migrants during his eight week journey to the US after the coyote or human smuggler his parents had hired to transport him to the US, abandoned him in Oaxaca, Mexico. As Zamora's poem, June 10th, 1999 represents, on that date, he was reunited with his parents after three attempts crossing the US-Mexico border. And he, uh, he began his life in San, San Rafael, California as an undocumented child. 19 years later in 2018, Zamora received a permanent resident card or a green card after returning to El Salvador to apply for a visa at the US Embassy. Previously, he had temporary protected status or TPS, which the Trump administration threatened to end in 2018, leading him to return to El Salvador to request a visa so that he could re-enter the US with official authorization and start the process of regularizing his immigration status. This underscores the ways that institutions are implicated in the production of dehumanizing narratives of immigrant worth and the rhetoric of good versus bad immigrants. Zamora was granted an employment-based extraordinary ability visa, also known as a genius visa, based on his record as a highly educated and award-winning author. And indeed, his work has been widely lauded. His 2017 collection Unaccompanied won a Firecracker Award for Poetry, a Northern California Book Award, and was a finalist for the Kate Tufts Discovery Award. 
Zamora's 2011 chapbook, Nine Immigrant Years, won the 2011 Organic Weapon Weapons Arts Contest. He has also received numerous academic and creative writing honors, including a 2015 National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship and fellowships from Stanford and Harvard. In 2015, uh, Samora co-founded the Undocu Poets campaign to support the work of undocumented poets and to end discrimination in literary contest and publishing. His much anticipated memoir, Solito, will be published in September of this year by Penguin Random House. And, and he is working on his second collection of poems. And without further delay, please join me in welcoming the fabulous genius, <laughs> Javier Zamora. <laughs> Well, um, gracias, Araceli, and everybody um, who put this together, and gracias, Elena Maria Viramontes, for being and existing. I certainly wouldn't be here without Under the Feet of Jesus. Um, that was a seminal book for me, and you have paved the way for a lot of us to exist. So I am very honored and never did I imagine that I would um, be here. Um, so thank you. And for the lecture reading, I'm going to attempt to walk um, you from El Salvador to here, both in poems from unaccompanied and new poems and also snippets from uh, the memoir. And so just bear with me. And I'm gonna begin with the poem that I begin every reading with. And it's weird to read now because I wrote this when I when Obama got elected, believing that I was never gonna get papers. And here I am now a green card holder because of my poetry which is weird, um, but this is to Abuelita Nelly. This is my 14th time pressing roses in fake passports for each year I haven't climbed Marañón trees. I'm sorry I've lied about where I was born. Today, this country chose its first black president. Maybe he changes things. I've told mom, I don't want to have to choose to get married. You understand. Abuelita, I can't go back and return. There's no path to papers. I've got nothing left but dreams where I am, the parakeet nest on the floor of the fuego, the paper boats we made when streets flooded, or toys I buried by the foxtail ferns. Do you know the ferns I mean? The ones we planted the first birthday without my parents. I will never be a citizen. I will never scrub clothes with pumice stones over the big cement tub under the almond trees. Last time you called, you said, my old friends think that now I'm from some town between this bay and our estero, and that I'm a coconut brown on the outside, white inside. Abuelita, please forgive me, but tell them they don't know shit. Um, of course, I don't curse in front of my grandma, but the poem deserved it. Um, and it's interesting reading that poem now because I genuinely thought that there was no path to paper. So there's a little hidden hope in that one. And that is my almost thesis for writing. And it comes out of anger and frustration and feeling at the time that I was at UC Berkeley when I began to write and being undocumented and feeling that it didn't matter whether I graduated or not because I still wouldn't be legal enough to work. And in that frustration, I created or recreated or remembered um, 
the people that I missed most. And those are the people that I grew up around. And if you've been in Central America, um, the town drunks are very prominent. And I'm from a very small town at the time. Now it's grown. At the time, I want to say less than a thousand people. So everybody knew each other. And there were, I want to say about 10 local drunks. And this is uh, my ode to my favorite one. And his uh, real name, which took me years to find out because everybody just knew him as La Belleza, the beauty. And his real name is Miguel Alcantara. And what you need to know is that this is me as a five-year-old speaking with La Belleza. And he had this one saying that he loved to say, and it's uh, almost like an anecdote. And he loved to say, ponele queso, bicho, which means put cheese on it, kid. For Miguel Alcantara, AKA La Belleza. Why you post on my fence and wait for water, Belleza? You don't know? I'm Rambo. Look at these muscles. They shine like this. Va. Call me Silvestre Escalón. It's pronounced Silvestre Belleza. Silvestre Escalón. Come mierda, bicho. I made the best desk. I had a shop. Ponele queso. Every night, I cut where branch meets trunk. When you gonna make me a desk then? I made desk, ponele queso. You know what that means? When I die, my phrase is gonna be on TV. It'll be like Celestre in that movie Cobra. He'll try to figure what that shit means. Puta, bicho, I'll be famous. It's Silvestre, belleza. And yes, I know what it means. What it mean then? Sounds like those maces with the cheese in the middle and the rat outside. Va, 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 va. You do use that coconut. I knew you were your father. You knew my father? Don't touch the tiger's balls. I made the smoothest desk. Ponele queso. It's all in the smell, bicho. Did my father say that? You're touching the balls. You're touching the balls. But look, it's something like when you go to the store and vodka is two colones, right? Right. The label says 80 proof. But rubbing alcohol is one cologne, 200 proof. So I'll wait for you to bring water. What does that mean? Look, I was passed out when he got in that van. He had a backpack, you were asleep. He didn't want to go. But the dollar is in war, bicho, ponele queso, ponele queso. And the rat won't leave. Um. And sadly, that was that it, he is perhaps one of two characters that I would have loved to have gone back and thanked and re meet. Sadly, he passed away in the 19 years that I couldn't go back. Um, but hopefully, people get to know him in a different way and just like how I knew him. He would stop by my house every 4 p.m. or at 5 p.m. and ask for water. <sighs> And from there, I will go to this poem, which weirdly, it was the poem that I first published in Poetry Magazine. And getting that accolade really opened the doors for me, literally. Um, um, in poetry, but also legally. And it's a weird path that I have taken for my quote unquote legality. And the poem is about a story. Again, I'm from a very small town. And I heard this story over and over from different people. I lived across the street from a clinic and there was a woman, the second character that I haven't written a poem for, but she's in my memoir. Um, uh, La Chele Gloria, uh, the white glory. Um, and she would sell um, fruits. And she was my favorite teller of this story. And the story is that I followed my dad when I was a, one, just one year old. 
across a field when he left El Salvador. And it is still unbelievable to me because who was watching me? Um, it was Don. I, I, so this is take it or leave it, but this is a recreation of that story. And this is how I learned to walk. Callate, don't say it out loud. The color of his hair, the sour order of his skin, the way they say his stomach rose when he slept. I have done nothing, said nothing. I piss in the corner of the room. The outhouse is far. I think orange blossoms called me to eat them. I fling rocks at bats hanging midway up almond trees. I've skinned lizards. I've been bored. It's like that time I told my friend Luz to rub her lice against my hair. I wanted to wear a plastic bag to smell of gasoline, to shave my hair, to feel something like his hands on my head. When I clutch pillows, I think of him. If he sleeps face down like I do, if he can tie strings to the backs of dragonflies, I've heard of how I used to run to him, his hair still smelling of fish, gasoline, and seaweed. It's how I learned to walk, they say, callate. If I step out this door, I want to know nothing will take me, not the van he ran to, not the man he paid to take him. Mom was asleep when he left. People say, somehow, I walked across our corn field at dawn a few steps behind. I must have seen him get in that van. I was too. I sat behind a saba tree waiting and no one could find me. Um, and that was when I was about to turn two. My mom left when I was about to turn five. And then I left and everybody, leaves, at least in my family, leaves at dawn. And this is the end of chapter one and the memoir, and this is the cover. It comes out November 6th um, of this year. The memoir starts um, a few days before I leave El Salvador and I leave El Salvador on April 6th, 1999. And it ends on June 11th the day after I meet uh, my parents in 1999. And it's sold from the nine-year-old's point of view. Um, and we were poor from a coastal region. I had only left to the capital a handful of times, like five. And I didn't know the rest of the world. So as a little kid, it was exhilarating. It was fun because I didn't understand the danger of this adventure that I was going to embark on. And this is uh, that dawn when I leave. And what you have to know um, that my aunt's names are Mali and Tia Lupe and my little cousin who was a year old at the time or five, five years old at the time. Her name is Julia. And this is April 6, 1999. It's dawn, indigo, like when mom left. Mali kisses me awake and I have to get ready. The roosters crow, la bonita barks, the birds sing, the world is waking up. The stars turn off one by one. To shower, I pull water from a well with a bucket. Grandpa already showered. Abuelita dries me off. Mali irons my clothes. The outfit has been picked out. A nice dress shirt, dark blue. Dark blue jeans, a black belt, black dress shoes. Next to the hard boiled eggs, avocado, queso duro, and tortillas, a black backpack. Even the brand name has been crossed out. Inside it, 
a dark t-shirt, black pants, two pairs of underwear, an extra pair of shoes, the plastic toothbrush, a comb, soccer shorts, Colgate toothpaste, a bottle of palm olive soap, head and shoulder shampoo, and another dark blue short sleeved dress shirt. There's a notebook, big pens, pencils, and the assignments my teachers gave me. Everything has to be dark colors, Mali explains. Don Dago's orders. I eat and grandpa waits by the door, holding my black backpack and his own regular one. He looks at his watch. Abuelita combs my hair. Mali kneels in front of me to button my shirt. She tucks it in, kisses my forehead. Lupe is here. The earliest I've seen her come visit. She hugs me, kisses me, wishes me luck. Julia is sleeping in Abuelita's bed between two pillows to keep her from falling. Abuelita kisses me, kneels to hug me. Then Mali and Abuelita hug me at the same time. Only now I cry. This is it, the thing I wanted to happen but it's happening so fast. Te queremos mucho, Chepito. Te cuidas. Que Dios te bendiga. Here, everywhere, always. We'll be waiting for you. Praying you'll make it there safely, Javiercito. Their voices almost in unison. Soft, breaking with every word. Tears running down the round faces, I can't stop crying. Then they make the cross over my forehead, over my head, over my entire body, wiping my tears with their hands. Grandpa grabs my arm, walks me past the door. Don't look back, he says, but I do. I see Abuelita and Mali in the middle of the door, holding each other. Lupe has a hand on each of their shoulders. Come on, grandpa says, and we walk. Um, and like um, Araceli uh, in September, not November. Um, and like Araceli uh, mentioned, um, I was, unaccompanied and the trip was supposed to take two weeks because we used the same coyote that my mom used so everybody trusted him because my mom got here in 10 days um that was in 1995 and i still don't know why uh he left us in uh guatemala but we already knew something was up because we stayed in tecunguman um, which is where this next passage comes from. Yeah, that's a border town in Guatemala for two weeks. And at the time, every Salvadoran got a 15 day permit to be anywhere in Central America. So my grandpa's last day um, was two weeks into it. So my grandpa was with me for two weeks of the eight, eight, nine weeks. But since after that, I was unaccompanied. So during this time, I, I was exploring a new town, I loved it. And what I want to get across in the memoir, uh, I, in a way I want to call out my grandpas and the people that I was with, racism and nationalism. This is the first instance while we were in Guatemala, uh, my grandpa uh, was in, for lack of a better term, racist. And our Latino community is very racist towards blackness and indigeneity. And so that's, as a nine-year-old, this is how racism gets passed down. And I'm just gonna read three paragraphs from, we are in Tecunoman in April. Tecun has one plaza, six benches around the main gazebo painted white an Apoyo Campero food truck parked on the street alongside other vendors, people begging, people playing music. 
Grandpa and I sit on the bench and people watch. People here look different. Grandpa calls them indios. And when he says it, it doesn't sound nice. I think they look like us, just darker than grandpa, a bit darker than me. All I know is that I'm an indio tambien, is what great great grandma Tina told me. She was the one who nicknamed Abuelita Nelly, which means truth in a language I don't know. Indios is what the nuns called us when we dressed up for El Dia de la Virgen de Guadalupe on December 12th. Mom loved that holiday. She dressed me up every year until I turned four. Somos indios, she'd say. I wore white canvas pants and a white canvas shirt. I wore a tecomate, a water bottle made from the morro tree, a kuma and yina. She even drew me a beard from shoe polish. Then all the kids dressed as indios walked in a procession to church. I don't understand why grandpa, Don Dago, Don Carlos, a lot of people in La Herradura and here in Tecun say that word with so much disgust. I like the dresses women wear. They're so colorful and pretty. Grandpa and I sit on a bench and people watch at the plaza every day. Even though he's never hit me, I'm afraid of his rage of getting him mad. But these six days, I've talked to him more than I have all those years in El Salvador. He's less strict than I thought. I've learned he was in the military, then became one of the first motorized policemen in El Salvador. I didn't know he was married before, that he was personal security for the president and other politicians during the war. That when he was, that when he was security at the airport, people gave him gifts like airplane dinners he brought home to us that he retired in 1995. I don't know what that means, but he explains he still gets paid for the work he's done. And that's some of the memoir. Um, I've never read that second passage. And it's a very strange holiday. And I don't know how, how else, I still don't know how to feel about that that all these kids dress like indios for one day of the year and yet the rest of Salvadoran society is still very racist. Um, and that is a lot of unpacking that we have to do as Salvadoran, but also as Latinx people in this country and in Latin America. And from there, I'll read a few new ones. Um, um, I will go to this one. And what I'm trying to do in the new poems is highlight the difference between Spanishes and how the Central American children immigrating here and their parents, we oftentimes have to feign Mexicanness in order to survive. And I remember even back in 1999, having to memorize different um, facts about like the Mexican national anthem I had to memorize or that Guadalajara at the time had three um, major soccer teams in La Liga Mexicana. Um, so little things if the cops stopped you. Um, so this is, kind of on that vein. And all the new ones, uh, most of the new poems are called Immigration Headline, and then they have a separate title. This is Immigration Headline or Accent Sonnet. And it takes place in Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico. To run away from the hot-headed dogs, boys and girls climb on top of a tree, branch by branch. They hang from inside a sheet, blue, like their pants. One day the tree grows fast. All the trees grow fast. The grass too. Understandable. Guadalajara is no normal place. Different accents. Guadalajara and eat nopales. Punctual train stations 
air-conditioned buses, unlike the previous shithole. But Mexico is also not the place where boys and girls will enroll in school, find a job, immerse in the marketplace permanently. Concentrate vos, yo no hables así, maje. They tell each other, dogs barking below in their local guau guau, orale, guau guau, orale, sing song. Boys and girls, come on, vamos, adapt please. So they practice, concentrate, orale, guau, guau, orale. They sing and repeat, sing and repeat on top of their trees. Until one day, they climb down to show off their new accents, like kneeling in church, like pledging allegiance to a sick dog. Um, and I'll read two more. And in the workshop, I talked that a lot of joy has been missing from my own work, and that is my own self-critique of all these sad poems. So with the new stuff that I'm writing, I also began to write during the pandemic, I miss dancing and I miss my two dances that I love are merengue and cumbia. And growing up in El Salvador in the 90s, you knew who Quinito Mendes was. And Quinito Mendes is Dominican and he's a merengue all-star. And my favorite song is Cachamba. So for the next poem, I try to copy uh, the form of the song because he says something and then says, repeats the same line and keeps building up on it. So you'll, you'll get that in, in my poem, but also the, the cadence. And I'll play a little bit of that song. So he builds up on it. Yeah, and there's also a back and forth. Um, and now the sun. Is my eyes move it. Um, so that is the rhythm. And here it goes. And when I go to the side, that's the chorus. And this is, there's a wall featuring merengue legend, Finito Mendes's Cachamba. There's a wall, there's a wall. There's a wall where people are tanning Speedos bikinis inside of a hammock on top of the wall near the Mexican desert. There's an agent, there's an agent, there's an agent. Chicken necks running toward the people with Speedos bikinis inside of a hammock on top of the wall at the edge of the Mexican desert. There's a deputy, there's a deputy. There's a deputy who ordered the agent to arrest the people with Speedos bikinis inside of a hammock on top of the wall at the edge of a river in the Mexican desert. A commissioner, a commissioner. Commissioner who said no, secretary who said yes to the deputy who ordered the agent running at the people tanning speedos bikinis inside of a hammock on top of the wall at the edge of a river in the Mexican desert. There's a secretary, the secretary, secretary who told commissioner I'm in charge, commissioner who told deputy no, who told agent arrest the people tanning in speedos bikinis inside of a hammock on top of the wall at the edge of a river in the Mexican desert. The president or the president president who said you're fired to the secretary who said I'm in charge commissioner who told deputy no who sent agent running toward the tanners and speedos bikinis inside of a hammock on top of the wall at the edge of a river the Mexican desert and the wall is me yes it's me I'm wearing a speedo yes he is inside a bikini yes he is I'm not Mexican no he's not let me tan please let him be please let me breathe let him live fuck the BP just fuck them please I see I see, I see, mamacita, I see, I see, I see, I see, mamacita, I see, I yeah. Um, and that's fun to read. Um, and I think the fun is what was missing in Unaccompanied. Um, and I'll think one more and then we can open it up. And I'll end with the same poem 
that I end. So I always open and close my poetry reading for the same with my grandma poem and then this poem that is, it wouldn't exist without the work of Roque Dalton um, and uh, Etheridge Knight. Um, if you don't know those names, Etheridge um, has this beautiful poem called Feeling Fucked Up. And I remember being in high school, seeing, I think he uses fuck 15 times in a 14 line poem. And it just blew my mind. I was like, holy shit, you can do this in writing. Um, and there's that. And then he also has a poem that imagines his um, funeral. And the Roque Dalton part is that it's very vulgar and it's on purpose um, because that Roque Dalton was one of the first poets in El Salvador who stopped looking to the US or to Europe in order for inspiration. He looked at the people and he talked like the people and he's of the people, which is why he's uh, everybody in El Salvador of any age knows who Roque Dalton is. Um, and that's it. Um, I think that's all you need to know. Como Tu is a poem written by Roque Dalton and the Estero de Jaltepec is the mangrove forest uh, area where I was born. Um, and this is instructions for my funeral. Don't burn me in no steel furnace. Burn me in Abuelita's garden. Wrap me in blue, white, and blue. A la mierda patriotismo. Douse me in the cheapest gin. Whatever you do, don't judge my home. Cut my bones with a machete till I'm finest dust. Wrap my pito in panties so I dream of pizzas. Please, no priests, no crosses, no flowers. Steal a flask and stash me inside. Blast music, dress to impress. Please be drunk, miss work, y pisen otra vez. Bust out the drums, the army strums. Bust out the guitars, guerrillero strummed. And listen to the war inside, please. No American mierdas. Caruse the procession, dancing to the pier. Moor me in a motorboat. De veras que se una lancha, driven by a nine-year-old son of a fisherman. Scud to the center of the Estero de Jaltepec. Read como tú and toss pieces of bread. As the motorboat circles, open the flask. So I'm breathed like a jacaranda, like a flor de mayo, like an alcatraz. Then forget me and let me drift. Gracias. Thank you, Javier. Everybody, please uh, join me in, in thanking you for this very inspiring uh, reading. Um, Wow, just beautiful. Thank you for sharing your work and your life with us. Um, we are so fortunate to uh, now um, here sit in on a conversation between um, Elena Maria Viramontes and Javier Zamora. Um, after that, we're going to be taking questions uh, from uh, the audience uh, in the Q&A. Um, but first we're going to... Um, uh, hear this wonderful conversation. And I just want to say to Helena that we are so thrilled that you join us today. You are the inspiration that brings us together. Your work has transformed the lives of so many and has helped to shape our field and shape our culture. We are honored that you have trusted us with your name for this event. Thank you so much, Helena for everything you do for us. I'm going to um, turn it over now uh, to um, Elena um, and Javier. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, uh, Ana and everybody, just 
this has been such an incredible experience to be able to listen to, to uh, poets and memoirists like, like, uh, like Javier. And I just want to thank everybody. I want to reiterate the, the, the gratitude uh, for bringing this together and, and, and joining in, um, in, in uh, organizing this event. It, it reminds me of what uh, Professor Lopez was talking about in making the public space, you know, in, in, uh, in doing collaborative work, because I think we have to be reminded of that. In, in our, uh, we have to be reminded of how to do collectivity, because we often forget about that. It's not, it doesn't come natural to us. It, it doesn't come natural to certain cultures, you know, but to some it does. And I think that uh, it, it was my, my uh, Chicanismo, as well as my, um, my politics that sought me out. I mean, that sought out places by which I could, I could work with other people and learn from other people. And so I see this all written, you know, uh, at writ large in this, in this lecture series. And I'm just so, so grateful and so happy. And okay, Javier, wow. I mean, what an incredible, I so enjoyed I so enjoyed uh, listening to you again. I think uh, I, I was uh, at the reading um, that you gave at, at Cornell, which I just absolutely loved, and 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 you know was was uh, asking you questions about about this idea of um, of pain and anger, and uh, you know this this, this underlining inspiration uh, that you had for this first collection of of poetry. And it reminds me about what what Anna Anna I'm not Anna Sandra Sandra Cisneros told me about my first collection when uh, you know people commented that there was no joy de vivir I mean there wasn't anything you know that I wasn't writing happy stuff <laughs> and I remember telling this to Sandra and she said you know what when a door slams on your hand you want to scream you want to scream. And that's and that's what that's what my first collection was. And I think to this a certain extent, this is your 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 first collection because it is filled with so much, so much, uh, so much rage and anger, but also the the beauty, the aesthetics that you have to create some of these poems. I mean that you've that that we're privy to, but actually the whole collection in and of itself um, is is such a marvelous piece of work. And so. I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm interested in, in uh, how you moved from, from this, 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 this anger and rage to this, this, this idea of, of uh, memoir. And because you, you hear in, in poetry, you give voice to, uh, you know, mom at the age of 11 and, and dad at the age of 13. But when you're writing memoir, it's something different. You know, it's a difference. And so, it, you know, uh, how did you go about doing that? And, and also, why did you pick this nine-year-old for this, this extended, you know, this extended book? Mm. Um, great question. And I'm all, I was also gonna ask you something similar <laughs> so after. Um, for, I think, in in the book uh, unaccompanied my poetry there was a huge chunk of my trauma that was missing which is what happened in mexico mm -hmm. um, and guatemala mm -hmm. and i think that even though for some reason uh, the images and the snapshots that i captured about crossing the border the, the sonoran desert were very vivid and I think they were like on the surface. And because of that, I had to put them down mm -hmm. uh, on paper. The other ones were deeper, uh, hidden inside. Um, I was still angry. Um, I was undocumented when I began to, to write poetry. Um, and I think that the anger didn't let me tap into the other layers of mm -hmm. the trauma. Interesting. And when I began to write, I, I like with every, once the book came out, I got teaching gigs, got fellowships. So slowly, I also have become more privileged and more financially stable. 
And I think pros for me couldn't happen without that privilege mm -hmm. and that time to sit down. And also the huge missing link that I didn't have while writing the poetry was therapy. And, and it was the therapy and my therapist who is also a child immigrant herself from the DR. Um, I think I needed, I've had therapy all my life, but it was that and the trust that I had in her, I think because she has had a similar background that I really got deep. And I remember even before, uh, the memoir wasn't supposed to be in the child tense. Um, I was writing it from here to like me now writing back then. Mm -hmm. But there's, it's something that my therapist said in therapy was like, why, why don't, if that nine year old was here, what would you tell him? And something along the lines of like, I need to fall in love with that nine year old and see and really see what sort of superhero he was to survive which mm -hmm. I hadn't never thought of it that way right. and that just unclicked something in me and wow wow well when you do the you know but memoir uh, um have your had you know ha, has your family read the memoir or I mean have you have you talked to them about the memoir because I I um I when I first started writing I didn't think anybody was going to read my work I was just writing because I was so excited you know and then when I realized when I shared my work and I realized that um, other people were saying you know this is oh, it sounds like my mother oh this is my father and then I realized that I was writing about a community so then I you know I then I took it a lot more seriously but the fact is is that I didn't you know I, I transgressed to a certain extent my family stories, you know, and, you know, my sister's stories, my brother's stories, my mother's story, my father's stories, and I made them into fiction. And that's why I'm so petrified to write memoir, because then I feel that there's a real transgression to a certain extent, because I'm telling, like you just finished talking about, I mean, that, that, that section that you read on your grandfather, you know, and the fact that, yeah, okay, let's admit it, we're, we're, we're all racist. Well, you know, it's because of the, the decolonization, you know, we have to decolonize our, our imaginary, but there you have it. I mean, so, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I commend you, but uh, what, what does your family say about this? <laughs> um, and uh, the, for the poetry, I checked every, all the, every time that I mentioned my parents or I, I speak in their voices, these are stories that they told me and I checked with them before I published them. And one of them, uh, naturally, um, I think my mom didn't want me to publish postpartum because it's, it's a very difficult time in yeah. her life. Yeah. But then eventually um, she let me, she allowed me to include it in the book. Wow. With the, with the prose, I haven't done that. And I have told them that I'm writing about that time and I haven't showed it to them, but I do have their blessing in writing about those nine weeks. And I think they are also curious because as a parent, they didn't want this for me. They mm -hmm. didn't imagine it. And we, the two, I've only talked to my parents three times about those times and every time they cry. Mm -hmm. um, oh. and, and I think it's gonna be difficult for them. But in the book, my parents are not in the book. They're like these figures that I was walking towards, literally. Yeah. It's only my family in El Salvador that you get to meet. My parents are just phone calls and what I imagined them to be because my memory didn't really allow, like I didn't know my dad. He was just an imagination. He was just a phone, a voice through a phone. Yeah. And so that's what I'm telling myself. <laughs> we'll see what happens once the book is out. Um, but I, that is part of also therapy now, like, uh, me talking to my parents and kind of preparing them yeah. for this in the world. You know, you know, it's interesting. I was, I was, um, I went to a reading by, uh, Bo Ha, who's a, who's a Vietnamese American, um, uh, spoken word poet. And he said, you know, he said that it was therapy that really changed his life around. And because of that, 
he found more love and joy than he had ever than it than he had ever experienced before. So, yeah, you know, let's say it's 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 <laughs> for therapy, man. You know, when yeah. the therapist to unpack all of these things. But just one last one last question. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about this this that you've organized or co-founded or worked in collaboration with this uh, undocumented poets? Can you tell us more about that? Um, it was in I think it was 2014 when I was in my second year of my MFA, thinking that I had a book ready for publication, um, and so I began to read. The publication guidelines uh, of the major contests at the time there were 12. I think the number has increased around the, the US. And out of the 12, I think seven, no, there were 15 contests. Out of the 15, 12 asked for requirements. Uh, and like it said, US citizenship. I see. Wow. Which me thinking that, oh, it's poetry, it's the van of the leftist vanguard liberalism, blah, blah, blah. Why are they asking for this? Right. And and for a lot of them, out of the 12, seven of them were like, oh, my God, we didn't know that was on there. Our bad. Like, we don't care about that. And they took it down. Ah, OK. And there were five that they didn't. Uh, uh, nudge, they didn't budge until uh, it was uh, Christopher Loma Soto, whose book is forthcoming from Copper Canyon as well. Um, and Marcelo uh, uh, Hernandez Castillo, who also has a memoir. Um, and Ca Marcelo and I were didn't have citizenship at the time. Um, Loma was born here, uh, but it, uh, they're a great ally. And it was Loma who wrote a petition that got signed and got emailed to so many writers. And it was only then that these institutions uh, began to pay attention. And the one to, to the last to, to agree was to the Walt Whitman uh, Prize. Yeah. And you would think otherwise. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but now they've also changed. Uh, but they were the ones, uh, the Academy of American Poets, and even that American poets, uh, they were really like holding on to that Americanness, whatever that means. Yeah, whatever that um, means. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. And and now it's still a group. So any previously undocumented or undocumented person can, can submit to the Undocu poets. Uh, I am no longer affiliated, um, but you can, they have a call every January and you can win. Uh, up to a thousand dollars to uh, help pay for, because submitting to these contests uh, racks up. It takes a lot of money to even submit. So the yeah, yeah. the thought process is that the this uh, winning this is going to help you submit. Yeah, that's 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 terrific. I mean, I think that it just shows you the power of of uh, you know getting groups together and doing something, which is what I think. Uh, that's what that's what. Uh, made me uh, uh, survive through the, the the Trump era, for example, mm -hmm. understanding that there were other people, like-minded people like me, and doing things like just going to to uh, group clubs or doing Zooms during the pandemic where people shared uh, poetry or fiction or stories or the, the books that they're reading. All of that was all of that reminded me of the beauty of collectivity, and so. That's fantastic. That's really fantastic. And now a question for you. Okay. Um, I know that you were an organizer in the 80s mm -hmm. and you were on the ground. Um, how how do you have you seen that sort of hands-on and you yourself are a writer? How have you seen writers either stay? Uh, I'm just asking the state of writer activists in the 80s and how has that evolved to now, the present day? Well, Where do you see us? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a really interesting question. It's sort of like um like an epic question, you know, because it's such a big um it's a big thing. But there, you know, for 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 us, there was no way of doing of doing writing without some kind of activism. It's 
it fed into it. When we, when we developed the Floricanto, for example, it was a celebration of stories and poetry and fiction. And, and anybody could go out there and read. Anybody, you know, you didn't, it, there was no notion of what, there was no notion of what poetry was or what fiction was or what, uh, you know, or, or even nonfiction. It was a simply that it was an acknowledgement that, that we are all together and that we share this, this, uh, you know, this, this beauty of language. We share this beauty of, of, uh, of imagery. We share this beauty of cultures, you know? And so, it, you know, it, was a, it, was a, it, it wasn't that hard to organize uh, in the sense of uh, just doing as you did, just getting people together. When we did the Latino Writers uh, Association, we just got together, we just threw all kinds of flyers out and said, whoever wants to come, here we're gonna be on Thursday between seven and nine. And sometimes nobody showed up, sometimes 15 people showed up. Sometimes uh, Tecato showed up, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, uh, MFA students showed up. You know what I mean? It was a whole array and it wasn't, you know, it was just for that two hours every week to be together and, and help each other do our work, you know? And then of course we needed to publish the work that we were doing. And so, you know, that's where the cheese may out of came along. And, and so we did our, we did, we did the work. I think now, um, I think there's a, there's a, there's a real opening. I just, I love the fact that, that your, your generation Javier is, is developing and, and winning prizes and, and moving, you know, moving the, the, our literatures and our voices and our communities and our cultures forward. And that really, really excites me. And it makes me feel so happy that, you know, because there are, there are times of course in our lives, especially as writers, I mean, I remember at the age of, of uh, 27 or 28 thinking to myself, maybe I should just quit this writing stuff and, and just you know, start, you know, pull up my sleeves and just get out into the community and start doing some political organizing, doing other things, you know? And it wasn't until I had to make a decision whether it was gonna be my activism or my writing because it takes, both of them take a lot of time, energy and love, you know? And then, but I, I decided, wait a minute, hey, I can imbricate, I can do the two of them. If one feeds off of the other, let me do that. And that's how I, and, and periodically, I mean, like, um, I mean, I have to say back in 2020, I, I really felt as if I was gonna give up. I mean, I, you know, the pandemic, I felt there was a certain, um, uh, you know, sadness with, with the way these world leaders were, you know, you know in India and, Brazil and the US, you know, these male, horrific, you know, ugly people who, who thought mostly about power and didn't think about the thousands and thousands of men, women, and children. And I thought, you know, does writing, is writing valuable for that, for the, 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 the resisting of that? And it took me a long time of just thinking and and praying and lighting candles and being with my own and the company of my own mind, as Toni Morrison would say. And then I came to realize, you know what? My work, I feel is important because I'm trying to show people that we can all be together, that we all are invested, that we all should be invested in each other because at one point or another, especially all of us, we're connected. We're connected in some way or another. And so let me write about this, this connection and these these intersections and these exchanges and these imprecations. Let me write about that. And then that made me feel better when I began doing historical research and archival research and testimonial research to put together these, these, uh, these histories and voices that I had never experienced before. I mean, in terms of this new book that I'm writing. And so anyway, Javier, well, how do you feel about that? I mean, what do you think about that? Um, I think there's, from my end, I think there's a really huge gap between activism and writing in wow. my generation that wow. I would hope closes, um, yeah. that I, I really admire your generation for. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I might, I might see it differently. Um, and I, and I really do think for, for me, like, for example, I moved to, to, to Tucson, closer to the border now that I can, mm -hmm. and to be on the ground and help whenever I can. Uh, I'm not an activist. I'm a writer first. And then 
I volunteer and try to do as much as I can for the immigrant community. Um, but that I see other, but I guess it's all, it's all, I guess like the, the word activist would mean, means acting and being here. Mm -hmm. And, and also writing is in itself activism but um in on the grounds on the being on the ground and writing i i see a bigger discourse now in this generation yeah. interesting how yeah that's very interesting i i uh yeah yeah i see i mean well in many ways we had no other choice because we mm -hmm. were, were we were trailblazing in the sense that there was there was very few people behind us i mean there was some 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 of uh uh, you know, like Luis Leal, for example, who was who was writing fiction, and 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 Rodolfo Anaya, but very few, and and uh, Estela Portillo, uh, Trembley, who you know uh, was one of the very few women uh, uh, Chicana write, writers, and so you know the the seventies hit us hard with, with the feminist movement, the Chicano movement, the civil rights movement, and so you know we we of course we had to be politicized, you know. Um, I think now with your generation, you have this, you know, the, the real uh, uh, exceptionalism of America just cracking up. I mean, just, just, just really disappearing. And, um, and, and you'll see, and you see the real, the real uh, natures of, of what the Americanisms are all about. And it's, you know, it's filled with hatred. It's filled with xenophobia. It's filled with, uh, um, you know, other, other very negative aspects. And so it's hard <laughs> yeah. to confront that, but Javier, I am just so happy that you're doing what you're doing. You know, it, it, it warms my heart. And one of the things that I said, one of the things that I remember to myself, and I always, is that, you know what? You, people cannot, people maybe will not like you because of the color of your skin or because the language that you speak, but they will not be able to ignore you if you fucking write well. <laughs> and that's what you do. That's what you do. You're a superb poet, hey. a wonderful storyteller. You know. So, thank you. That is a thank wonderful you. thank you. Thank you, Javier and Elena, for this wonderful conversation. And your last message there, Elena, I think is a wonderful way for us to move uh, to our audience. Um, and uh, Dr. Macy Rojas from Chicano Latino Studies is going to be. Um, asking those questions. And um, so we're gonna move to that. Thank you. Hi, Javier. Um, so we have five questions in the Q&A. And also um, I have some questions from my students who, as I shared with you earlier, read your book. Uh, they just finished it last week and they had some really um, touching and, um, and uh, insightful questions and comments um, about particular parts of your book. So um, we'll start with a question from the audience, Stacy Macias, who says, gracias Javier. Curious why you self critique the tendency to rely on dismal and dark themes in your work. Um, because I feel that I, and you always feel this with first books, I guess, but I feel that I should have painted a fuller self of who I am. Um, I never imagined people would read the book. I never imagined that I would be in front of a crowd five years after the book was published uh, and still talking about that book. And I feel that if I only, a lot of these strangers that I meet only see me in that light. And I would have, I would have included like, I'm not saying like 10 more poems, but like, one or one to three poems in which I focus on the happier times because I'm not only my trauma. And so that's why I self critique now, you know? <laughs> All right, awesome. Um, and then Noah Garcia asks, uh, Chicano Latino identity is something that's constantly trying to be confined by the people and culture around it. How do you develop your own sense of self while also living a world that's trying to define you already? Hmm. Um, I've always considered myself brown, <laughs> uh, and I think uh, as a Central American, oftentimes I have felt excluded by the term Chicana, and and I know even like we see this play out in 
in Chicano, Chicana uh, studies departments now. Uh, with, this is a conversation that is happening. Um, and so for me, I've always said I am the color of my skin. And because I come at Latinidad um, questioning it. And we are a group, we are an ethnic group, but we're not a race. I think oftentimes we as Latinos, we think that we are this monolith, uh, this one race, either akin to like black and white, Asian and indigenous, but we're actually all of those. And I think it is, we are at a time, a political time too, because a lot of us are voting Republican that we need to look and analyze our um, colonized mind, like um, Elena Maria Veramonte was saying, um, and that we, a lot of us have white ideals inside of us. And that's why oftentimes we are very racist. And so th that's, that's how I approach it. And as an outsider, I've always felt like an outsider and I've always felt that there is no term. And I, the one that I find most affinity for is the term brown. All right, thank you, Javier. Um, so now uh, the following two are from the students. Um, one, Miguel says, I admire your work in this book, and I want to say that it takes real courage to share traumatic experiences with the rest of the world. And then um, Valerie says, uh, has a question, what poem hurt the most to write, including if you felt like you shouldn't include it, but you did? Hmm. Um, that hurt the most, but I think the most difficult to write was the long poem at the end, June 10th. Uh, and some things in there are, for a lack of a better term, are the rawest. And raw in the sense that I had to strip all punctuation in order to get the words down and to just trust the content and not try to dress it up with beautiful language. It is what it is. And, but before that, I was trying to dress it up. Um, and it's, it's talking about what it feel, what it felt like to get here. And it was the beginning of it, what eventually has become the memoir. Um, there are images there that I was just beginning to tap into. So I guess that is the hardest thing that I wrote in the, in the first book. That's lovely. Okay, now this is a question from the audience uh, from Cristina Acosta. My question is for Javier, my question for Javier Zamora, thank you for highlighting anti-Blackness and anti-Indigeneity in the Latinx community. I am U Uemi Chicana and I always knew I was native, but only imagined it on one side of the man-made border that cuts across my tribe's community. It wasn't until Chicana Chicano studies at CSU Fullerton, uh, or Fresno, sorry, I'm not sure which one, <laughs> um, where I recognized I am indigenous across borders, that borders are not real. Do you think the ceremony with the children dressing up like indigenous people for one day, and yet being hateful toward them in the greater community is akin to white people, quote unquote, dressing up like Native Americans? Oh, and it's from Fullerton. Yeah, yeah, it is a very problematic, um, thing that has to be addressed in El Salvador. Um, and it's, and it is complicated because a lot of the people in my town, and it's complicated because if, if everybody in my town were to be like, yes, we're all indigenous, like my grandma was indigenous. She spoke Nahuatl, um, um, my great grandma. Um, so in that sense, that is our native dress, but it shouldn't be a custom. When you only sport it for one day of the year, it becomes a custom. And when for the other days of the year, you use the term in Indio in a negative sense, then yeah, it is the same thing as a white person sporting native dress. Um, and these are conversations that 
uh, not only El Salvador, a lot of um, Central American and Latin American countries need to have. Um, and just saying that we have both black and indigenous in us and that that's okay. Um, there's this myth in, in Salvadoranness that we eradicated and, and that is what uh, people use that, oh no, we don't have black people or indigenous here because we kicked them out. And that is what the government told us since 1932. Um, there was a thing called La Matanza, which has been the biggest massacre in Latin American history over three days. And that still reverberates to this day. And I think because of that, people in my country are racist. And so, yes, I would agree with you. Okay, our next question is from Carolina Espinosa. Javier, I truly appreciate your work, especially when you honor the anger, frustration, and trauma that living undocumented in the US entails. I was undocumented most of my teen years and early 20s, so the trauma is deep. In your writing, how do you find balance to tell the realness of our story and also show that we are more than just the pain? The image that comes to mind is a senor who would stop by your house in El Salvador and ask for water? Um, it has been difficult. And I think this is where the self-critique comes from. Um, for me, at the same time that I've been angry, writing my trauma has been healing. I mistook it to be the only type of healing that I could do because I, I didn't approach therapy seriously. Um, and it is, I don't know, it's just difficult. And, but I felt that nobody was gonna read this and it was just for me and that I needed to get the shit out. And if I didn't get the shit out, I was gonna fall into a deeper spiral. And we're talking like depression and self-hatred. Um, because I felt so frustrated being undocumented and having gone to college and having an MFA, but things like things weren't lining up. Um, so I felt like, oh, I am here, like for lack of a better term, like I am your model immigrant and still I have nothing. Um, so I get where that's coming from. And my immediate uh, reaction and emotion was anger. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, that's that's all I have for for that. Okay. For that question. Okay. Um, okay. Our next question is from Alfredo Heredia. The italics of non-English words in literature is a force that others, the language and the people who speak it. When they challenge that power dynamic, how can new writers potentially push back from that common conception of how language should be treated by to publishers who don't see eye to eye with the writer? Oh, uh, I just, I don't italicize stuff. Um, I just include it, um, it as is, and uh, the reader has to do that work. And in both my books and this memoir, this memoir is even more salvi lexicony. Like there are slang that I throw in there that I don't translate, and it's up to people to look it up, to know it or not. Um, so that is how you don't order other yourself because that's just how we talk. Um, and that is how I think. Um, and there are little minor, not an aggression, but a re, repossessing of the language spoken in this country, which is not only English, but it's Spanglish and it's gonna become even more so. So I think the othering is gonna be less if we continue to not other ourselves because there are other outside forces that want to other us still and who are gonna keep or want us not to uh, code switch, but it's not actually even code switching, it's just the code. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, you know, actually, there was another question from a student earlier um, that may tie into it, it that he asked, Randy asked more simply, um, did anyone try to censor a part of the story you were trying to tell? No, 
Um, I think I have a really good agent and the editor to um, be didn't really. I was expecting people to like tell me to change uh, the Spanish in it, but no, they actually respected it. And I think they wouldn't have before 2020, if that makes sense. There, there is, I think the pandemic did open everybody's eyes that there are different people and both, both my editor and my agent are white. Um, but which I was already like, you know, doing this, but no, um, some, the good people get it. Um, and yeah, so I haven't had that experience. Okay, and I think we have time for just a couple more questions um, from one our, question. sorry? About one more question we have one, time. One more question, okay. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, here's one about masculinity. We know how masculinity can overrule someone's identity and coming from a Latino background, we see how social practices and cultural representation are associated with being a man. How were you able to overcome that in your writing since it's very sentimental and emotional? Therapy. <laughs> uh, that and even before then, uh, I was raised by women. Um, my, my dad was in the picture, but not really. Um, and I have like my grandpa. It, it has been hard because the men in my family and I think a lot actually not only in my family i have issues with women and i don't think they realize it and i think that is a common thing and we're talking about patriarchy and also to the point like my my grandpa was violent uh towards my my grandma and for me it has taken poetry and getting older, reading, and most importantly, therapy to kind of divorce the upbringing, those 19 years of knowing that. And this is what Latino and all types of men uh, should do. Um, I still, we all have that ingrained in us. It's like a computer system that we must slowly erase, you know? And it's a thing that gets um, supported by society because society is patriarchal and sexist and racist, sadly enough. So we have to be aware every day of our decisions and what we say. And yeah, I don't know, therapy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Javier. I really appreciate you answering all these questions. And I'll go ahead and now turn it back to Dr. Sandoval. Thank you, uh, thank you Javier, so much. This was just um, such an amazing experience, such a wonderful conversation. Um, I want to thank you and on behalf of the committee and on behalf of our Cal State Long Beach community. And I know that uh, there were um, members of the larger community also online with us today. So thank you to all of us. I mean, thank you to all of you uh, for joining us today. Thank you, Helena, for continuing to inspire us with your generous spirit and your beautiful work and for being here with us today to uh, have a beautiful conversation uh, with, with Javier. Um, thank you again to all of our sponsors. Um, and I have a special message to our students. Um, if you were inspired today, if what you heard today was meaningful to you, I want you to consider taking courses in our Chicano Latino Studies Department taking courses with us or signing up for our major. Um, this is the kind of content that our courses uh, and our major will provide you. Uh, so I encourage you to look, uh, look in the chat box for information. We have our website there. 
Um, and I think I also, I also put the location of our office. Um, so again, thank you everyone. Thank you to our sponsors, everyone who had a part in this, um, big or small. Um, and just a special thanks to Javier and Elena. Thank you. You are doing activist work. There is no doubt that your writing is doing that work. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank yeah. you, the department and everybody that attended. And gracias, Elena, for being you. Love you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.